Um, so, Guy and Jason, can you tell us what's the most evil thing you've ever done, or at least what's the most evil thing that you've been accused of? What, what sticks in your craw? What, what makes you, uh, well, what doesn't make you sleep, uh, stay awake at night? If you've ever done anything that you feel like maybe if you had that to do, bad, do again, you might do it differently. The one thing that I, I have recurring nightmares about and I deeply regret is that when I was about 12 years old, my parents bought me a BB gun. And I took this BB gun and I shot this little bird. It's a Japanese bird called a mejido. And so I shot this mejido, just, I don't know, that's what 12 year old boys do with guns. And my grandmother was so disappointed in me, and to this day I remember that, that I wish I had not shot that bird. And so, I don't know, it's just, that's the best thing I can come up with right now. I'm a boring guy, what can I say? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so obviously going back to the age of 12, uh, Jason, you grew up on the uh, streets of Brooklyn? Yeah, so uh, I'm sure you've seen some evil in your time. <laughs> anything, uh, I, so I, I want to step up a little bit of level from that. So if, you, if you're not going to admit to anything evil, what's the most evil thing you've been accused of, perhaps unfairly? Um, when I was 12 years old, uh, <laughs> we used to throw ice balls at buses and <laughs> one time the bus you know the bus we the idea was to get the bus to stop and get the driver to chase us and that's the idea that's the idea you really want to piss them off wow. and it wasn't working we had okay. done like we had thrown ice balls at like 10 buses so i said i have an idea i'm going to wait for the bus and pretend i'm going to get on you guys hide in the basement over there and under the steps of the brownstone and when the doors open and i feel terrible about this too um, <laughs> i actually do uh, the, door, the bus is opened on the New York doors, as you've probably seen them, and go like that. And I stepped aside and held it open like this, as six of my friends pelted snow ice balls at the poor bus driver. Oh, like, you are, you and he are. got hit by like 15 times. <laughs> and the guy was like 300 pounds, and he was like, oh, ah, boof, and just pelting him. And I just, I feel really bad about it. Not as bad as killing a bird. I mean, that's really bad. <laughs> but, see? Because, uh, I mean, an animal can't defend itself. Only a psychopath would kill an animal. I mean, that's, you have to have some really oh, psychotic right. bent to want to hurt a bird. I mean, Obviously, what has a bird done to anybody? I mean, that's serial killer level shit. shit. I mean, <laughs> what kind of person wait, wait, does wait, wait, that? Hold on a second. Audience, which is more evil? Think, shooting a bird or ice balls at the bus driver? Shooting a bird? Yeah, see? Ice balls at the bus driver? Yeah, not as, uh, not as not as far apart as you think. <laughs> Barely. All right, so <laughs> let's let's dive into uh, all top and Mahalo here. So I guess I want to. You guys are both running these companies now. You're yeah. you're entrepreneurs. You're in the chair. Um, do you think there's ever a decision that you've made that could be perceived as evil, uh, but was really for the good of the company? Uh, you know, something either for your partners, customers, maybe your employees. How do you, how do you feel about the way that you're running companies? And you know, is is some altruistic goal important in running a company? Are you really, you're in it for the business, the business good is the best thing, and you know, all that we care about is profit? Huh. Um, she needs a microphone. God, I just, I'm a boring person. I just cannot think of, uh, there are, you know, so first of all, Alltop is as a metaphor an online magazine rack. So we aggregate feeds by topic, and we have about 700 topics. And um, let's see, if I, were Mu if I were Rupert Murdoch, I would say, well, guy, you're aggregating feeds, and you're creating a page of aggregated feeds, and you're selling advertising, so you're stealing money from me and the Associated Press and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, which in his mind would be pretty evil. My interpretation of that is I'm aggregating feeds from the New York Times so that I can present a better UI so that more people can go to your, your newspaper and give you more page views. So that's my justification. Um, I, I don't think I, we're getting the Yeah, I read it. Like, yeah. Geez, Let's I just, dive into something. So, Guy, you have, a, you have people who tweet on your behalf on occasion. Yes, absolutely. Now, do you more than <laughs> regularly. Sure. They're and probably doing it right now. Do you pay them? Yes. You do pay them. Okay. Absolutely. Do you pay all of them? Uh, yes. Okay. 
And, and do you feel that it's evil to have other people tweeting on your behalf? <laughs> Obviously not. Okay. Uh, Jason, do you have any, uh, any concerns about that issue? Do you feel that that's... Are you asking me if I think spam is a good thing? Whoa. Spamming? Wow. Lying to your followers? Being dishonest? No, I'm fine with that as long as... Uh, uh, how is that dishonest when I... Clearly label the tweets. No, that it's are from it's my ghost. fine. It's fine. Oh, okay. It's fine for him to have a ghostwriter. I, I mean, you you've had Twitter works. Listen, you've had ghostwriters on both of your books, right? So no. what's the difference? None. None. My books. <laughs> my books are not ghostwritten at all. Right? <laughs> yeah. so, We're just kidding. I, I would say, Guy has moved uh, very quickly to be one of the top bloggers and top tweeters quite quickly. So he can, whether or not you believe he's spamming, he, can, he understands immediately. I'm joking. But quite quickly. But you know what? The, I, almost by definition, Twitter is very difficult to spam people because you're voluntarily following. So if you don't like what I tweet, as I say, UFM, which is UFM, which is unfollow me. It's, it's oh, that oh. simple. I don't, what's the problem? Okay. You don't like what Jason tweets, don't follow him. Just okay. Go, bitch. So let's, uh, <laughs> I agree. Let's keep it clean here, above the, above the belt. Um, so let's, let's talk about uh, Mahalo a little bit, Jason. Uh, actually, wait, I, I want to cover a different thing. Jason, you ostensibly stopped blogging yep. some time ago. Yep. And yet, when I go to your <laughs> website that I think is called a blog, and you have occasionally written on it, wouldn't you call that blogging? Uh, when I re retired from blogging, uh, that was done as now, is strictly as Michael performance Jordan art. Jordan retiring or well, if retiring? you go back, if you go back and you read the post. I put the, a transcript of the press conference with MSNBC and the New York Times asking me questions about my retirement. It was obviously a joke. I did it as a piece of performance art. Wait, so you're saying you were lying when you were retired? No, I was making a joke that some people who reblog and don't only read the first half of the post were too stupid to read the bottom where I was quoting Lou Gehrig and putting my name on it. I mean, people are idiots, so it's not my fault. It was a joke that I was retiring from blogging. Oh, okay. And it was a way to get people to join the mailing list, which 17,000 people did, and it works out very well. When you got that notice, did you think that he was making a joke, or did you think he was retiring from one? Um, he didn't care. I don't read his book. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 uh. I don't, I don't read the books. Ask the audience how many people thought he was retiring. It's no, that's all right. That's Why all right. not? It's not that how many people thought he was retiring? See, How many people don't give a audience. shit? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I don't give a That's shit. A How many of you are virgins out there? All right. Yes, okay. Um, Ask them if they masturbate. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Are, they, are they masturbating right uh, now? <laughs> well, let's, let's ask this question a little bit more generically. Do you think startups have to be tough in order to survive and succeed? Yeah, okay. as opposed to what? Great. So what's the difference in your mind between tough and evil, and is there any difference? <laughs> Do you think that people who are entrepreneurs need to make tough choices? When, when does tough go beyond being tough and start to infringe upon the rights of customers, employees, partners? Well, I, listen, I think that people know when they're being tough, you can be tough in negotiations, and I think there's times when maybe you're being a dick, you know, like, and nobody likes that. I mean, what's the point in, for example, blocking a competitor's phone from your platform when you're trying to get everybody to be involved and the guy whose application you're blocking is on your board. Like that was the whole thing that was weird to it. For, for me, it's like, isn't Google Maps powering the maps on the iPhone and isn't Eric Schmidt on your board? Like do you really have to be such a control freak? I mean, and do you have to sue a blogger? You know, like Apple is just crazy. Well, that, I can't tell you how many either. times. They've been suing bloggers I know, but that, that, is, that is exactly the point. Apple is suing their fans and trying to find out who these anonymous Apple okay. bloggers are. They should be thrilled I, that there I are bloggers. I think you think Apple is evil. I, I want to get to the start. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just talking about that. <laughs> On a startup let's, basis, you have to. A very, let's take a very specific example. Some company has an entrepreneur. They're trying to get a new employee. And they tell that employee, hey, I'm going to give you 5,000 options in the company. And the employee says, that's great. How, what percentage of the fully diluted options of the company does that represent? And the response is, well, I really can't share that information with you. It's privileged, and we just don't do that. Is that evil or tough? Stupid. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I would say that's dumb. I mean, what difference does it make? You can tell them how many shares there are. You can tell them the price of the share. It's unnecessary, okay. I think. Um, and being well, deceitful never gets you anywhere. I mean, it could be part of the application process because any applicant who says, oh, yeah, okay, you should in honor. It's too smooth. <laughs> Okay, so, so you think that's really just a case of smart versus dumb hiring practices yeah. that go evil there. No. Um, how about when you're dealing with partners? I guess, let's, let's take the case of uh, Microsoft over the years, pretty hard with their partners, you guys would say? God? Yeah, yep. so? And nothing evil about that? No, I, I think you cross a line in evil when you do deceptive things like you tell your interns to go to another person's website or a blog, and, you know, go to the TechCrunch article announcing a competitive product and put a lot of negative comments. That's evil. That's yeah. just wrong. Okay. What, what about uh, putting fake comments on a YouTube video in order to pump up the views? Of your own? Of, uh, of sure, your own, yeah. sure. Also evil. It's just also that's evil? unethical. Yeah. Unethical. So anonymous comments? Okay, so yeah. now let's get into the controversy issue. You guys both use controversy uh, as, as a vehicle for both marketing and, and your own publicity. Would you, would you agree with that statement? Not purposely. I just, <laughs> <laughs> I just tell the truth. I don't know. Jason? I, I, I actually feel the same way. I, you know, somebody said I created the concept of link baiting, and I was like, I just say what I feel. And a lot of times, it's sort of bluntness has gotten me pretty far when I was a journalist and doing conferences, so I just continue to say what I feel. I have, you know, the, the good news is, I don't, an, for the first part of my career, I was an outsider, and nobody wanted me in the industry, and then the second half of my career, I've made enough money that I don't give a shit what anybody thinks. And so, it, it's a great place to be, and why should I throttle myself now? If I think what Apple's doing is wrong, I should say it. If I think what they're doing is right, I say it. And people, I think my personal brand, I also think Guy's personal brand, uh, and I do like Guy's brand, and I do think he's very smart, uh, even though he's never had a successful company. Um, is he will? He will. I, it's gonna. It's the law of odds. Um, but I do. It's a joke. Wow. It's a joke. Posters. Exactly. Oh. Posters. Absolutely. I actually I use that. It's great. No, I I think uh, the the blunt and honest uh, part of my personal brand is what people like, and I think that's exactly what they like about Guy. You can, we can disagree about stuff, but I would never disagree that whatever guy says is what he feels. I know he's honest. And I think that's something to be admired, considering so many people are so full of shit, and they put airs on, and that, you know, they'll never say, like, I think what Zuckerberg is doing is wrong, or I think that this is wrong. You should be really honest. And, and, that's, and that's what I love about blogging. That's why I did a blog company. I loved transparency. I loved sticking it to people who wouldn't tell the truth. That's why blogs exist. You know, um, thank you for that. I think. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even feeling Part worse about killing that bird. Um, <laughs> but I will tell you something. Um, when I blog, I have really, not that I can remember, I've never written a negative, you know, sort of attacking piece of crap product service blog entry. I've never done it. And, uh, like, for example, car manufacturers send me cars all the time to review, and if I don't like the car, I just will not blog about it. So if, by definition, if you see me review something, it's because I liked it. And I've done that because I just don't have it in me to trash something. Um, I'd rather not say anything. So for example, a, a company sent me what was supposed to be an iPhone killer, and I used it for about a day, and I said, oh, this is the worst phone I've ever seen. I just will, I refuse to, I refuse to blog about it rather than blog negatively about it because I didn't want to, I don't know, I just, you know, somebody in Mountain View designed that phone and really thought it was great and all that. I, it's not in me to go and like stomp all over that person, so that's, I, I guess you could say, well, it's not being dishonest because I'm not lying and saying I like something I didn't like. But it's not full disclosure in the sense that, you know, I let it rip when I find something negative in order to prevent people from buying a lousy phone or a lousy car. So that's something I struggle with. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I'm getting a lot of you guys on the evil versus good topic. So let's, let's flip to sort of market power versus non-market power. Okay. Um, when companies are in a position where they have market power, do you think there's situations where they push the edge too much to the detriment of their own opportunity? 
and I, I might use the case of, again, maybe Microsoft in the past where they had a absolutely, and to still to some extent, have a, an insurmountable almost lead on the desktop and, and really push people, push other competitors to the point of not really being helpful and maybe, you know, incurred some uh, DOJ attention as a result of that. Do you, do you think that there are companies who can push the limit of, of monopolistic power so far that they're actually not doing themselves any good? You know, actually, I believe in market forces as the most powerful thing. If you look at the, da the um, Justice Department uh, and also the EU sort of uh, giving Microsoft a hard time and telling them, like, you have to unbundle the browser, you know, and all this kind of stuff, it's like by the time they made their judgment and got involved in it, the government is so inefficient and stupid, it didn't matter. It was like, yeah, Firefox exists. We have a viable competitor. And so the government, by the, by the time the government gets involved, the company's probably on the downturn or the issue is not important by definition. Um, so I, I'm a much bigger fan of innovation. A everything Apple's done um, you know, to date uh, in their resurgence is based on one thing and one thing only, uh, excellent execution. It's just excellent execution. Now that they've done excellent execution for this long, uh, you know, what they layer on top of it is the issue. Um, but Market forces always win. I think we've all learned that. I mean, that, and that's why I don't worry about Google. If Google started doing nefarious stuff with their search results, it would become so obvious, and so many people are watching them with their 70% market share and privacy issues and storing everything for 18 months, that it's not in their best interest to do anything heavy-handed. It's not, because it just draws more attention to them. They would rather sit there and quietly make billions of dollars in profit a year than draw any attention. They'd rather lay low. That's why they don't do content projects. That's why when YouTube started getting into content or they launched Google Null, Google pulled back. And I talked to people at Google when they launched Null. I was like, are you competing with us? Are you competing with content? I wrote a little editorial about it. And I had a phone call with eight Googlers about it because they were so concerned about the perception that they were going into the content business and going to cause a channel conflict. They are acutely aware at Google of the fact that people think that they have monopolistic unfair advantage, et cetera, that they actually do less. I think they do less than they, they, they are entitled to in many cases. And if Apple keeps going the way they're going and Android keeps getting better, uh, Android will do to the iPhone uh, you know, what, what Apple has done with laptops to you know, Microsoft uh, in, in terms of beating them on market share. It's inevitable. If this platform becomes tighter and tighter, and uh, the hardware will catch up and Android will be more open, and the developers here who are waiting six weeks or four weeks to get their application loaded and are sick and tired of you know, not being able to launch a, a music application or a porn application will start launching them on uh, Android. And they'll get instantly approved because the second you make them available to the public, they are in fact approved. So the market solves all problems. H how did we get from two weeks to six weeks? Oh, it, it can take that much. Oh. It has. How many iPhone developers took Four weeks or more, yeah? Yeah. Was How it a, was it a, um, what, it's animation, so, no, what, no, just if, you were, if you were, e if you were thinking Apple's evil, what were they trying to prevent Animoto from being on the iPhone for? Yeah, I mean, so the account manager got back to me afterwards and he said, I know you sent me an email every week, you called me, but other guys are screaming louder. And so they got you know, squeaky. <laughs> really? Yeah. Other guys are screaming louder is why their application. So what you said. You need to go take that guy out for a beer. Absolutely. But see, this is not evil. This is incompetence or under-resourced. <laughs> <laughs> you know, something else. Too right? successful. Yeah.